What's up guys, Weasel Rogan here, and welcome back to the MMA meeting, Let's Talk with the Weasel podcast, where we talk all things MMA, and I hope you guys are having an amazing day. There's been quite a bit that's been going on in combat sports in general, from the rejuvenation of boxing, I guess you would call it, to some of the recent stuff in the UFC. So first of all, what I saw today was... Stephen Thompson is a bit upset at this whole thing revolving Hamza Shemaev. Basically, what he said was, he doesn't understand why Hamza, who's number 15, who fought one guy in the welterweight division against someone who's actually a 155 or 0-2 right now, is getting all of the attention from the UFC and getting a fast track to a title shot. He said that for himself, he had to fight Murderer's Row, and so did other contenders of this division. Yet, Hamza Shemaev, who is 1-0 in the welterweight division, is like one or two fights away from a title shot. And here's the other thing, if you remember, Wonderboy was supposed to fight, or he at least got offered to fight Hamza Shemaev. Yet, he turned it down due to the ranking, saying that it doesn't make any sense. Now, where I do understand and agree with Wonderboy is that... Through a meritocracy, which the sport kind of fell away from for the majority part, yes, Wonderboy should get a title shot even over Hamza Shemaev. Leon Edwards should not have to fight Hamzat, and Hamza in general should not be even close to a title shot. But, again, we are not in a meritocracy anymore, and it seems like Wonderboy possibly missed his chance, and he might be a little bit upset at that fact. Or should I say he's more upset at how everything is kind of going, how the landscape has changed. But this landscape has changed years ago when Conor McGregor changed the sport pretty much. The whole meritocracy, earning your title shot, going through the rankings, beating contenders, all that stuff. That is true for some fighters, but it is not true for superstars. It is not true for stars. If you have a big name in the sport, you have favoritism. You're going to get special benefits that other fighters don't have. Hamza Shemaev is one of the biggest names in this entire division already. He's only 1-0 in the UFC's 170-pound division, yet he's a bigger name than almost everybody. Who's a bigger name than him? Jorge Masvidal and maybe Colby Covington, maybe Kamaru Usman. He might be a bigger name than everybody else when you look at social media numbers when you look at the traffic around this guy so he's gonna get some special favors and the fact that the UFC is pushing him so quickly proves how big of a star he actually is and proves how big of numbers he provides but again this has been going on for a while now and it's kind of weird to think that Wonderboy didn't really understand it right when it happened here's how it all should play out Wonderboy should have taken this fight in fact everybody who is not about to get a dollar shot like maybe Colby Covington should want to fight Hamza Shemaev if it is offered to them They want that fight because, again, he's a bigger name. You'll get more eyes on you if you fight this guy. Number two, you stop that train from moving. You derail it. And number three, you do the UFC a favor as well. They want you to fight this guy. If you turn it down, they're like, okay, you missed out your opportunity because this guy's going to be a star. You're going to be kicking yourself later once this guy becomes a superstar. Then you're going to want to fight him after that, and it's going to be too late. But the fact that he's a little bit upset about this whole situation doesn't really warrant any kind of grievance, to be honest. Again, I love Wonder Boy. He's one of my favorite fighters of all time. But man, you have to understand the business side of the sport just as much as the competitive side because a lot of these guys, especially the older fighters, they don't pay attention to the business side. And it's very, very important, especially when matchups are given to you. It's good for Leon Edwards because, frankly, this will be Leon Edwards' biggest profile fight in his entire career, even more than fight Kamaru Usman, you know, in the early parts of his career, which a lot of people don't even know about to this day, that they fought each other. Hamza Shemaev is the biggest fighter Leon Edwards has ever fought in terms of name, in terms of popularity. That is actually what Leon needs more than anything else right now. Leon needs a name. He needs people to pay attention to him. Because he has the skills and he beats someone like RDA who's a really good fighter. He's on this great win streak. He has everything about him that you would want to be the number one contender. But he doesn't have that name that people are very much excited about. Just the hardcore fans. And not just hardcore fans. I'm talking about super hardcore fans are excited about him. General hardcore fans, which is like a sub-tier inside this whole thing. They're not even that excited about this guy yet. right? If he goes out there and starches or destroys Hamzat... He's going to get his title shot, 100%, because then the fans are really going to get behind him. But if he loses, it was the risk that needed to be taken, I guess. Because frankly, anybody that Hamza beats was going to be inevitable because this guy is going to be active, right? He's going to fight everybody. He might fight the top five in one year. Imagine that. He might be the only champion in history, if he becomes champion, that is. I'm not saying he will. I think he might lose to Kamaru Usman. If he becomes champion, he'll be the only one to fight the top five in one year. Like, that is absolutely possible for this guy because of how active he is. 
And we got a little bit of a hint from Dana White that Justin Gaethje versus Michael Chandler could be the backup plan to UFC 257, which is kind of crazy, huh? I mean, any Conor McGregor fight you want to back up because it's such a big fight. A lot of people are going to want to watch that card. Justin Gaethje has a bit of a name. Tying himself to Conor McGregor as well as fighting guys like Tony Ferguson and Habib and Dustin Poirier. Gaethje has a good name. A lot of casual fans remember that name. And if he goes and fights Michael Chandler, it could prove to be a good fight. And frankly, this is the fight a lot of people thought was probably going to happen once Tony Ferguson and Charles Oliveira got put together. I like this fight a lot. It's the former World Series of Fighting Champion versus the former Bellator Champion. It has a bit of a, a bit of prestige to it, but I wanted to see Justin Gaethje fight Dan Hooker. But to be honest, I'm not too worried for Dan Hooker because great for him, Huffa Dos Anjos came back down to 155, and that fight makes perfect sense given that Hooker really has no one else to fight that makes any sense at all. Maybe he does a rematch with Paul Felder, but I think Huffa Dos Anjos is a fight that he and his camp are really going to want. A former champion, a guy who's probably better than his ranking, a legend of the game, one of the greatest lightweights of all time. I think it's a big, motivating fight for Dan Hooker. But in regards of Dana Wine and Gaethje versus Chandler as a backup plan, it also might have solved the question we all had as to who is Chandler going to fight. Now we know that they're looking at Justin Gaethje. And I guess it makes a lot of sense. It would be a very explosive fight, very powerful fight. I mean, those guys would go at it. Ultimately, I do think Gaethje would beat Michael Chandler, to be honest. I think he would stop the wrestling completely and just pretty much I'll strike him, counter him, attack him from a distance. If Gaethje gets into a war, man, his chances really plummet because Chandler might be more powerful. He's definitely faster. And what we do know about Gaethje is when he goes to war, his cardio is not the same, right? He gasses out pretty quickly. But ultimately, if Gaethje does fight smart, if he follows what his coach wants, he will definitely win that fight. And we just got news that Anthony Johnson is going to Bellator. This surprised everybody because he's been teasing a heavyweight move or a light heavyweight move in the UFC, right? He said he wanted to fight Francis Ghana one time. Then he said he wanted to get the belt at 205. Then all of a sudden, he goes to Bellator. And the thing that really surprised me about this was the fact that Bellator turned down Yoel Romero, yet they signed Anthony Johnson. Yes, I understand that Yoel is over 40 years old, and Bellator does not want old guys like that, doesn't want guys over 40. But Rumble is not young. He's in his mid-30s, and he's coming right out of retirement. He mentally checked out of the sport. That is one of the worst signs in a fighter coming back into the sport, right? If you mentally check out like that... He said he's not a fighter. He said he quits in fights and all this stuff. He said he's just not a fighter. He's good at it, but he's not a fighter at heart. That is definitely not good for a guy coming back into that same sport because you can't change that about yourself. If you're not a fighter at heart, you're never going to be a fighter. If you're not a martial artist at heart, you're never going to be a martial artist. And now that I think about it, it might have been a good move for Bellator to sign Rumble instead of Yoel because Yoel might be the first MMA triple champion. Like if he goes to Bellator, I think he beats Gegard. I think he might beat Vadim Nemkov, and I'm pretty sure he would beat Ryan Bader at heavyweight. So they might sign a guy that may be a little bit too high level for everybody else in that organization. Rumble, on the other hand, if things get rough for the guy, he kind of just quits on himself. And someone like Nemkov can absolutely tap into that. And ultimately, they can just say, hey, we beat one of the best light heavyweights to fight in the UFC's organization. Our champion destroyed Anthony Johnson. Whereas if Yoel goes into Bellator and destroys everybody, they can't really say that. The fans will only know Yoel as one of the best UFC fighters who went into Bellator and just shows how how high level UFC is. But if they get a guy from the UFC, bring him to that organization and see him lose to one of their own fighters, that is a big deal, man. Just like how Lovato Jr. defeated Gegard Musasi. That was big for Bellator. And what we found out is that Combate Americas seems to be very interested in Yoel Romero and does seem to be a good place for him to go to. He'll be a huge name over there. A lot of the Spanish-speaking countries are going to love this guy. And frankly, he might even be a huge star in a lot of places around the world. But one thing I do like about Yoel going somewhere like Combate is if he has a difficult fight, we know that guy he's fighting is good. We can scout talent by watching who Yoel fights in that organization because a lot of people around the world do not pay attention to the organization who are not from that area. Right, for an example, a lot of people notice how good one championship was when Eddie Alvarez went over there and lost. When Demetrius Johnson went over there and was getting touched up by some of their bantamweights. Right, we were like, oh man, there's some really good talent in Asia that a lot of people in America didn't know about. A lot of people in Europe probably didn't know about. Now we could probably see what's happening in South America and Central America. Like, what's going on over here, right? And if Yoel goes there in the middleweight division or light heavyweight, whatever division he wants to go to, and he gets a tough fight... That's going to be pretty exciting, man. So I welcome that. And I do agree with Errol Hawani. I don't want to see Yoel in bare knuckle boxing. When you go to bare knuckle boxing, it seems like, not to discredit the sport, but 
it does seem like a place to go for the older fighters trying to just get back into some sort of combat sport and it could be sad to see sometimes so definitely don't want to see you all go there you all is also a rich guy i don't know how much you got in that lawsuit where he was supposed to get like what 27 million dollars because of the whole tainted supplement thing but whatever he got out of that organization had to have been pretty insane and I've seen this debate going on for a little bit now regarding Henry Cejudo, who tends to be around the sport even though he's retired. He's always saying something about the champions, all that stuff, but we have no word of him coming back at all. But the debate is about who saved the flyweight division. Regarding Davis and Figueredo's success and how the flyweights are getting a little bit more interest these days, more fans are being more interested in that division now than probably ever before, ever since you know some of Demetrius Johnson's final fights in the UFC. The argument is now coming up who saved the division and who made it to what it is today. Henry Cejudo saved the division. 100%. He saved the division from dying. TJ Dillashaw was practically like a plague coming down to the flyweight division to kill it off. And I believe TJ even said he didn't care about the flyweight division. He just came down to be double champion, right? He was going to win that belt and go back up to the 135. Division's done. There's no champion. And now in hindsight, TJ tested positive. So imagine he beat Henry Cejudo. Imagine TJ became the flyweight champion, test positive, and now you got to vacate that belt or give it back to Cejudo. That division's done. Like there's no more interest in it. TJ came down, wiped out the champion, tested positive, and now you don't really have like a steady champion of that division anymore. So by Cejudo defeating TJ, he saved that division. He fought off the plague. But then he immediately, the next move, goes back up to Bantamweight and never comes back down. So he just saved the division from dying. But it was Davis and Figueredo who made it thrive, I guess. Who made it a little bit more alive. Gave it some life so it doesn't go back on life support. Cejudo saved the division. Figueredo is kind of what made it what it is today. And yes, if it wasn't for Cejudo defeating TJ Dillashaw, Figueredo might be fighting in another organization. But without Davis and Figueredo, it'd probably go back into that state of nobody caring about the division, nobody cares who the champion is, and ultimately goes back on life support. So ultimately, they both had a great deal, a great effect on that division, and a great effect on many of the fighters who really should give some respect to those two. Because of Demetrius Johnson leaving the UFC, Cejudo went up and left the division. There had to be somebody. Somebody had to grab a hold of that title and start putting on performances and create some interest for that division before the organization just cuts it off. Because for a moment there, it was looking very scary for the flyweights. But all thanks to Davis and Figueredo, man. And ultimately, as hard as it is to say, Joseph Benavidez also was a big important part of this whole thing. Almost like the sacrificial lamb for the flyweight division. He needed to be sacrificed pretty much or dealt with in order for Davison to dominate this division and put on the performances he needed. Because those finishes over Joseph Benavidez were absolutely crazy, man. And I guess it needed to happen. Poor Benavidez, man. And now let's go right to the questions. We're going to start with the most liked comment from What's Up People. Who do you reckon has the most unique style in each division? Keep up the great content. Unique style in each division. Um, Heavyweight is probably going to be Surreal Gan. Like, heavyweight is definitely Yuri Prochaska. Middleweight has a few interesting styles. So you have Darren Till. Marcus Perez is an interesting style. But the most unique is most likely going to be uh, Uriah Hall. Uriah Hall has always had a very unique style. Speaking of middleweights, whatever happened to Edmund Shabazian? He's still fighting, right? Well, then we go to the welterweight division. Carlos Conde has always had a very unique style. Even still today where he has adopted many things to his game, he still has an incredibly unique style. Elijo Dos Santos has a very unique style. Their song Kinan. You can actually say Damian Maia has quite a unique style, at least in modern days, given that he only really does jiu-jitsu. Some striking ability, some kind of pressure on the feet, but it's all in order to get the opponent to the ground. He's one of the only guys to pull guard consistently and actually make it work. So you can kind of say the way he fights today is something a lot of people don't fight like anymore, in a way dictating that it is unique. There's also Gunnar Nelson, very unique. Anthony Pettis is extremely unique. But I'll probably say the most unique guy in this entire division is Michel Pereira. You don't get more unique than this guy. Lightweight division is Tony Ferguson for sure. There's quite a few unique styles in the featherweight division. Bruce Leroy always had a very unique style. The most unique I would probably have to say is Ryan Hall. And it's one reason why nobody wants to fight him. Bantamweight has a lot of unique styles. Tisha Dillashaw and Corey Sandhagen really stand out in this division. But the most unique is definitely Dominic Cruz. To this day, nobody fights like this guy. He's been around for so long. And back then, everybody thought he was just a one-of-a-kind fighter. And still today, we think that. That is crazy. Usually, long-time veterans, especially champions get mimicked by a lot of the younger fighters coming up. Not Dominic Cruz. I mean, the only guy that really did it was, 
I guess you could say TJ and Corey Sanhagen, but even they are more fundamentally sound and less unique than Dominic Cruz. Flyweight division is probably going to go to Tim Elliott. There is Davis and Figueredo, of course, but Elliott seems to be still very strange. Now, there's not a lot of the woman fighters that have a very unique style. A lot of them really gravitate towards the fundamentals of the sport, and because of that, a lot of them do fight somewhere similarly. I'd probably say in the bantamweight division, Holly Holm has the most unique style. Women's flyweight division is probably going to go to Jessica Andrade, given how like no one else is able to fight like her because they don't have the attributes that she has, her strength, her power, her pressure, her volume, all that stuff. She is very unique because of her attributes, and that directly influences her style. But the flyweight division definitely has fighters like Joanne Calderwood, who fights pretty unique. Caitlin Chukagian is also unique. But I would say Jessica Andrade is the most. And then the women's strawweight division, you do have Mackenzie Dern, you do have Angela Hill, but the most unique is probably going to be Rose Namajunas, and it greatly stems to her athleticism. She could do a lot of things that other fighters cannot do. Carolina also has a very unique style, so it might be her. It's either Carolina or Rose. Then we go to the second question by Senior Roberto. Who is the best fighter in each weight class that has never won a UFC title? So you're saying is, which means currently. Heavyweight division is probably going to be Alistair Overeem. Light heavyweight division is probably going to be... We'll see. I don't know if Alexander Gustafsson is still fighting. If we include Gustafsson, it's probably him. Or it's going to be Glover Teixeira. The middleweight division... It would have been Yuval Romero, who was one of the greatest fighters of all time to never win a UFC title. But currently... Huh, there's no one that really stands out. Because look who you have. You have Paulo Costa. You have Jared Kedinier. You have Darren Till. You wouldn't even include Marvin Vittori at all. You have Derek Bronson, who could probably be the guy. Maybe. Um, Kelvin Gaslam. They're all relatively around the same level. Maybe Derek Bronson? I don't know. That's a hard one. But the welterweight division, you definitely do have uh, Colby Covington, if you don't include interim titles. You do have Damian Maia, who's been around for a very long time. But I'd probably say in the welterweight division, if you're not including interim, it's Colby Covington. If you do include interim, then it's probably Wonderboy Thompson. The lightweight division. If you inc- if you do not include interim, it's for sure Tony Ferguson. Tony Ferguson is arguably top three lightweights of all time. And out of those top three, he's the only guy to not win an undisputed title. So no interim included. It's Tony Ferguson. With interim included, that does eliminate a lot of fighters. Because the entire top four have won some sort of title. Justin Gaethje, Dustin Poirier, Tony Ferguson, and Conor all won a title. Number six also won a title. Who's Rafa Dos Anjos? Man, this is tricky. It's either Dan Hooker or Charles Oliveira. Or it's Donald Cerrone. It could be Donald Cerrone. That's a tough one. Featherweight division would probably have to go to Korean Zombie. Given the totality of his featherweight career. I mean, defeating Dustin Poirier back in the day, going to war with Leonard Garcia, one-shotting Mark Hominick for the fastest knockout in UFC history, defeating Frankie Edgar, having that comeback after two years. I mean, Korean Zombie has done more in his career than most of the fighters in this division. So I probably have to say Korean Zombie is the greatest fighter to never win a title. Now you do have, of course, Brian Ortega, but Brian Ortega has not been fighting for that long. He's only beaten a few top contenders, whereas Korean Zombie has done it for such a long time. You know, he's been beating top guys for years now. The bantamweight division, could be relatively arguable. You do have Marlon Moraes if you include his World Series of Fighting career. If Uriah Faber is still fighting, I'd probably say it would be him. There is also Aljamain Sterling, so i probably say it is Sterling or it's Moraes because you can't include Frank Yeager, you can't include Cody Garbrandt, Dominic Cruz is out, Jose Aldo's out, Petra Jan's out, TJ Dillashaw's out. If Faber is still fighting, it's Faber. Other than that, it has to be either Sterling or Marlon Marais. One of them two. The flyweight division, it's for sure Joseph Benavides. He's one of the greatest fighters, regardless of weight classes. He's one of the greatest fighters to never win a title in UFC history. Let me go to the women's bantamweight division. So Nunez won a title. Jermaine Durandamy won a title. Holly Holm did. And that leaves a lot of fighters who can take this spot. You do have Juliana Pena. And I'm thinking it might be her. I'm going to skip the flyweight division because that division is new. Women's strawweight division, though, definitely has to go to Claudia Gadea. Like 100%. She's been at the top of that division for such a long time. She's defeated such good fighters. And even her fights with Yuan were very competitive. She is probably the greatest female fighter to never win a title. And then we go to the next question. Vibov Negi. What if Tony Ferguson trained like other athletes in a gym? Would he have been a much better fighter or not? No. Like If you change the way they train, you're pretty much changing their mentality of how to go buy things. right? And Tony is unique. His uniqueness directly influences his style and the way he fights and how successful he is. Perhaps if he uses wrestling a little bit more, at least offensively, he probably would be a better fighter. But his unpredictability, the strange style that he has, all that stuff is the reason why Tony is Tony, right? If he fought like every other fighter, he would not be Tony Ferguson. He'd be just another wrestler with some volume to his striking, some decent boxing. And that's pretty much it. He'd be very 
similar to a lot of other fighters in the sport with an insane reach. You also have to know if he trained like other fighters, he probably wouldn't have the same kind of cardio he has right now. The guy trains like a madman. Listen to the stories about this guy. He does not train normally. He's training six hours a day. Normal fighters do not train six hours a day. He's also doing some weird stuff like what you saw in Embedded where he's crawling down the stairs and then he runs up them. Even though how strange that looks, it definitely works you out, man. That's hard to do. The stuff he does is not for your average fighter. Your average fighter cannot do a lot of things Tony does. He's probably developed these kind of muscles you never knew about. Like he has muscles in areas we didn't even know existed because of the strange ways he works his body out. So I would say... Because the mental aspect, Tony would not be as good of a fighter as he is right now if he trained like every other fighter. Then we go to FQSH. Who wins a rematch between Dustin Poirier and Justin Gaethje? This is an interesting question now. Gaethje's demise in that fight were repeated inside leg kicks and shelling up whenever Dustin Poirier advanced on him. Right, it allowed Dustin Poirier to chain up combinations, go to the body, go to the head, get around the guard. If Gaethje rather moved away after he struck or moved away from Poirier's punches, it would cause Poirier to overextend. Because of that, he has many opportunities to counter Dustin Poirier. So what I will say for sure is, it would be a much more competitive fight. And that fight was pretty competitive. If you make it more competitive, does the fight swing to Justin Gaethje's side just a little bit? I would say Gaethje would probably win a rematch. He has a better chin. He's tougher. He could last five rounds. He's not going to get tired. And he's not going to repeat a lot of things for Poirier to get the hang of and start solving a lot of those problems. And also the big thing about Poirier are his combinations. When you move away from them, he overextends. He creates giant windows on himself for the opponent to strike through. And a patient Justin Gaethje could definitely make a lot of things work in that fight. So I'd probably say Gaethje would win a rematch. Then we go to Feet It. Opinion on Dana White saying Tony had his chance and don't want to give him a title shot again when guys like Frankie and Yuel are getting a title shot anyway after losing in the fight so Dana seems to have changed his tune a bit because he said the winner of him versus Oliveira might get a title shot so Dana seems to be changing his tune on that especially with how the landscape is moving that might also mean that he's not as confident that Habib is going to stick around that's what that probably means and I 100% agree with you Frankie got a title like a million times. He well gets a title even after losses. Tony definitely should get a chance. I mean, if he doesn't get a chance at a title shot, and most of the reasons why he never got one is not even his own fault, seems to be extremely disrespectful. Just a further trend on the Tony Ferguson disrespect train. And then we we'll go to Bruh. Do you think Tony is washed up as Habib said? Or do you think he still got it? And impersonally, I think Tony is still a monster. Hard to know, man. I mean, we haven't seen him slow down. We haven't seen him get old and washed up yet. But we are going to have our answer when he fights Oliveira. The damage he took from Gaethje could be life-changing. So, it's hard to know. I haven't seen it yet. I don't think he looked washed up against Gaethje. I think it was just a style he didn't really prepare for. Also, Gaethje showed up better than anybody ever expected, even to Tony's expectations. And he just got beat. He got beat by a better fighter that night. Then we go to OMG, it's Schlock, 2612. Did Tony allow Lee to take him down early in their fight to let him gas himself out, or did Lee badly out-wrestle him early? Well, there were three different takedowns Kevin Lee got on Tony Ferguson. The first two, definitely not. Tony Ferguson did not want to get taken to the ground, but the third one, he did accept a takedown very early, and that was right before he submitted Kevin Lee. Maybe he was noticing that Lee was starting to get tired and didn't mind going on the ground with him. On that third takedown, you can see him prepare himself to get into guard instead of defending the takedown. He widens his legs apart and gets his legs on the outside of Lee's hips as they're standing, just where he'll fall on his back and fight in the guard. But then you look at the first takedown, Tony Ferguson does what Tony does. He kind of like slides in with his lead foot trying to, I guess, kick back. Kevin Lee's foot or something. Kevin Lee goes in for the takedown and Tony digs in a quick left underhook and uses momentum to turn and throw Kevin Lee over. And he also tries to get on top of Lee during this whole reversal. The second takedown, he just gets outright taken to the ground. Double leg takedown lifted and slammed. He tried to actually defend it a little bit. So I will ultimately say no, he didn't want to get taken down. He didn't allow Kevin Lee to take him to the ground besides the third one. Then we go to Lucas Hekila. Who do you think will be the champion at the end of 2021 in every division from strawweight to heavyweight? End of 2021. Wow. So pretty much like exactly a year from now. Good time to answer this question. I might actually make a video about this. I might just make an entire video, but quickly I'm going to go through it without too much analysis, too much thought about it. I will say in the strawweight division, it's going to be Rolls Namajunas. Flyweight division, Valentina Shevchenko. Bantamweight, Jermaine Durandamy. Flyweight, Davis and Figueredo. Oh, that's tough because he could go up to Bantamweight before the end of 2021. So it's either Figueredo or Eskar Eskarov. Bantamweight's going to change quite a bit, I think. I'll say Corey Sanhagen. 
but I could definitely see Petr Jan holding that title as well. Featherweight, I'll say Brian Ortega. Lightweight, I'll say Conor McGregor. Or Tony Ferguson, one of the two. I'm leaning towards Conor. Welterweight division, Hamza Shemaev. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, welterweight division, Kamar Usman. I think he holds his title. I think he's going to be extremely dominant. Middleweight division, Israel Adesanya. Light heavyweight division, Israel Adesanya. Heavyweight, Israel Adesanya. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think it might be Francis Ngannou. Either he defeats Stipe or Stipe is going to get stripped because I don't know what he's doing right now. He hasn't fought in a while and it doesn't look like he's fighting anytime soon. So I'm going to stick with Francis. Then we go to Flying Guillotine 1999. Jake Paul versus Dylan Dennis and Ganu versus both the Paul brothers at the same time. So this is boxing. I'll say Jake Paul beats Dylan Dennis, although I do think it's competitive. And Ganu... Oh, what does Gano do to both the Paul brothers? I mean, right hand goes and knocks out Logan, and the left hand goes and knocks out Jake Paul. First 10 seconds of the fight. He should just go to boxing. They're holding this guy back so hard, and I think it's mostly on Stipe's part, but let him do what he wants now, just because no, nobody wants to fight him. Let Francis just go and fight whoever he wants in any sport he wants. I think everybody would watch it. They would an okay dude. How would Cejudo do against Jan, the Bantamweight top 10, and then Figgy? Thoughts on Jeff Chan, MMA Shredder's channel, and would Iron Chin Garbrandt and Reem be champion? So I'm going to skip the Bantamweight Top 10. I think we pretty much all know how that will go down. Uh, Cejudo versus Jan. I think he beats Petr Jan, although I think it's competitive for all five rounds. I don't think either of them gets finished. I think they, I think both of them do get dropped in the fight. But I think Cejudo's wrestling is going to be the difference in that. Even though I do think Jan can adapt in a fight, he's a very good wrestler. I think he will start to take control of the boxing. Maybe some of the linear movements from Cejudo may throw off some of the combos and some of the punches from Jan. But ultimately, I think Jan is going to go to the body, mix up a lot better, go to head kicks and stuff like that that Cejudo is probably not going to see. And ultimately, Cejudo is going to have to wrestle heavily in this fight to win some of the rounds. I think it's going to come down to that competitive Round by round fight. Who wins the round? It's very hard to tell. I think Cejudo's wrestling with some of his dominance on top is going to win the majority of the mid rounds. So I think Cejudo wins second, third, fourth, while Jan might win the fifth and the first. Or Cejudo wins the last three and Jan wins the first two. I think Cejudo beats Figueredo. I think his wrestling's too much. I think his pressure is too much. I think he's going to see some of those punches coming from a mile away. You also have to note Cejudo trains with the Pitbull brothers who have a very similar striking game to Figueredo. Very karate-esque, very powerful right hand, sniping power and all that stuff. I think Cejudo relatively dominates Figueredo, to be honest. And I don't know MMA Shredded's channel, so I apologize for that. And Iron Chin Garbrandt is not a problem. For Overeem, it is a problem. Overeem needs an Iron Chin. If he can have an Iron Chin, he might be the champion. But again, even if you have an iron chin, you're probably still going to get knocked out by Francis Ngannou. So I don't think that changes. I mean, definitely have a better shot at being the champion. Maybe his fight with uh, Stipe Miocic would have went differently. He would probably won the belt. He dropped Stipe with one punch. He got pounded out with a swiftness. Like the first punch on the ground and pound knocked him out essentially. So maybe iron chin there may have changed the tides a bit of how the ground exchange would have went. But for Garbrandt, perhaps his iron chin will allow him to brawl it out a little bit more go to war a little bit more but that's the problem war garbrandt is not what we need to see because yes with an iron chin and a lot of power and a lot of speed he's going to be a hard guy to brawl with but he makes bad decisions when he's trading with the opponent he throws the same punch over and over again you could brawl and still be relatively intelligent in it such as pedro munoz pedro munoz was throwing at least both hands at least he was moving his head Garbrandt was sticking his chin up in the air and throwing the same punch over and over again and just moving forward. So with that mentality and that style, I don't think Garbrandt with an iron chin would be champion. I think a smarter Garbrandt will be a champion. That's his biggest issue, his fight IQ, and basically his emotions. If you can control his emotions, he's good. He might be hard to beat for anybody. And then we'll go to Noise Magician. A personal question, will you ever do a face reveal when you reach a certain milestone? I was thinking about doing that 250,000 subscribers, but I don't know. I, I think a lot of people like the way it is. Maybe one day I'll post something, but I don't think it's going to be a normal thing for the channel. Uh, maybe if I start another channel, like a second channel, maybe I'll do it there. But I'm thinking about it a little bit more. I mean, a lot of people do want a face reveal and a lot of people don't. Right now, I'm kind of thinking it through. On my Instagram, though, I am going to post myself hitting the bag or something like that. Probably by the end of the week, probably by Sunday or Monday or something like that. I have been battling like this sickness I'm having. I've had this one problem for so long now, ever since I was a young teenager. I don't know if it's the same thing my family has, but on my mother's side, they've all had this colon problem, this intestines problem running throughout their family. And hopefully it's not what it is, but I've been battling with this for a long time. And 
recently, okay, so now it's gotten a lot better. I've been controlling it. I've been changing my lifestyle a bit, especially my diet, and it's been getting a lot better, working out a lot more. The lockdown, all that stuff, it's really affected me. Going to the gym and stuff was my way of really controlling my health and keeping myself healthy, but with the lockdown, my sickness really got out of control, and it got really bad like two to three months ago like really, really bad to the point where I couldn't eat anything. And because I lost a bunch of weight, I frankly lost almost 15 pounds. And that's not from fat or anything. That's muscle. That's good weight I lost. If you guys remember like a year ago or whatever, you guys asked me how much I weigh and how big I am and all that stuff. I'm 5'11", and I used to weigh like a year ago. If you guys remember, I weighed like 175 pounds. Right now, I weigh like 160. I've never been this light ever since I was like in middle school. But I am gaining weight again. I am getting a lot healthier. I'm doing kind of my own thing around the house, working out and stuff like that. And I've been recording a few things. And I did record myself hitting the bag a bit. So I'm very excited about posting that. Maybe I could make that a normal thing on Instagram because I don't know what to post on Instagram. It's not my usual thing. I'm not a guy who usually posts pictures and stuff like that, but maybe I can use it just to post myself doing certain things, you know, hitting the bag, certain workouts. Uh, Maybe I can imitate certain fighters and show what happened in a fight on my Instagram. That'd be pretty fun. Like certain combos, like I've been working on these specific combos that I see nobody throwing. Absolutely nobody from gyms to fights. And they work. I use them in sparring. I use them in training. I use it on the bag. And maybe I can show you guys some things that I'm working on. Then we go to, oh, this is going to be a challenge. Gisli Hoffren Janssen. Opinion on strongman boxing between Thor the Mountain Bjornsson and Eddie the Beast Hall. I think it'll be pretty fun. It's uh, one of those freak show fights, I guess. It's not a professional fight. It's going to be an amateur fight, most likely. I don't know if they're wearing headgear. I really don't even know the specific rules of this fight. Probably bigger gloves, headgear, less rounds, shorter rounds. They are bigger guys, so they are going to gas out very early. And when I mean bigger guys, I mean giants. I've seen the mountain box before, and man, the cardio is just not there. It's it's probably not going to be fun after two rounds. The first two rounds is going to be pretty crazy. It's going to be fire, but after that, it's probably not going to be fun anymore. Maybe they should just make it a two-round, four-round fight. Like, push it to four rounds, that's it. I think everybody will get what they're looking for. And for people who did miss my video on Connor going through that kind of light sparring with the mountain, I still hold most of the same opinions on that. I think Connor would defeat the mountain in a fight. I know a lot of people back then, like years ago when I made that video, a lot of people disagree with me. It seems like with more examples of inexperienced guys going up against professional fighters, people are starting to follow the skills rather than the size of the inexperienced guy. And it's what I've been talking about for a very long time. You can ask Brian Ortega for an example. They asked Brian Ortega if he were to have fought the Iranian Hulk. I think it's a Photoshop guy. I think someone found him in real life and he was just like a normal looking guy, a little bit bigger, but they asked Brian Ortega, how would he fight this monster? And he pretty much said the same way I said Connor would probably beat the mountain. Just get him tired, move around a bit, make him chase Ortega. After like a minute of this, they are most likely going to start heaving. And that's when you kind of put it on them. Same way when Demetrius Johnson was asked if he could beat up the six foot four interviewer that was interviewing him or something. He said the same thing pretty much. He said, I'll just go for your liver. I'll go in and out. I'll do a lot of things to you. I can get your neck. A bunch of other stuff. Then we go to Brian Samedi. Now that, oh, hey, I know where this is going. Now that Rachel Ostevich is most likely getting cut from the UFC, are you looking forward to her doing OnlyFans? Oh man, this is hilarious. And she kind of responded to this whole thing. So I do feel a little bit bad talking about it. But it, I mean, it was always as a joke. I hope I wasn't the one that started this because I'd feel really bad if I was the first one that said this. Can't say I'm not looking forward to it though, if it happens. And then we go to Kelvin Gonzalez. Out of the contenders at 155, Gaethje, Ferguson, Poirier, McGregor, Hooker, Oliveira, and RDA, who and how many do you see Michael Chandler beating? I think he loses to all of them. So I'll say he definitely has a shot at being Gaethje, Ferguson, and RDA. He definitely has a shot. He gets torn apart by Poirier. He gets sniped early by McGregor. He gets overwhelmed and discarded by Hooker. Oliveira takes a limb, and the other guys put up a, a very interesting and competitive fight with Michael Chandler. So I don't think he beats any of these guys. I won't be surprised if he does, but I do not pick him winning any of those fights. Now, even though this doesn't have like the most likes, it's definitely a very good question by Noah Sakurada. And actually, it's something I talked with my cousin one day. Despite Lightweight being perhaps the best division, the top five contenders seem to have been for a while pretty much all strikers apart from Tony's BJJ threat. Do you think Habib would be so dominant if Lightweight's top five wasn't so striker heavy during his reign? How do you think Habib would do against offensive wrestlers such as Usman or Covington if their weights were identical? 
thinks? This is a very good question because everybody has to agree. If the top five had wrestlers instead of majority strikers, Habib would not be as dominant as he is today. And yes, even though Justin Gaethje is a defensive wrestler, he doesn't really fit the mold of offensive wrestling to even shoot takedowns on Habib. Now, will that be the best idea? Who has shot takedowns on Habib? I think RDA shot a couple. And April drew heel shot on him and actually got him to the ground. But he quickly got wrapped up into a triangle choke. Now, that's the thing, man. Habib is good off his back. We've seen it before. We've seen him go for submissions. We see how fast he is off his back. So even with the offensive wrestlers like a Usman or Covington, I don't think they do well with him on the ground. I really don't. Don't. Even Usman and Covington, if they were to fight Habib, they probably will not beat him once it hits the mat. They are a lot more one-dimensional with the wrestling compared to what Habib provides in the grappling. So now that I think about it, if the majority of the top five were wrestlers, he could actually keep his striking against them and beat them. At the end of the day, I think he's dominant whether they were strikers or whether they were offensive wrestlers. The more important thing is defense against Habib's wrestling rather than offense. We have Justin Gaethje who has insane takedown defense. Conor McGregor has decent takedown defense. Eli Quinta had good takedown defense. And they could not stop the guy. They would a tar pit. Should playing possum be illegal since it could interfere with the ref's ability to keep fighters safe? No, I don't think it should be because if you trick the ref when you're trying to trick the fighter that you're hurt or something like that and the ref stops the fight, that's on you. The ref isn't always going to know whether you're hurt or not. Playing possum is to trick the opponent, but if you trick the ref at the same time, then it's your fault if the ref stops the fight. Now, I know a lot of people will probably point to um, Ian Kutilaba versus Magomed Ankolaev, that first fight. That was the ref's fault because there were way too many hints, way too many signs that Kutilaba Lava was faking it and he wasn't really getting tagged that much and he wasn't even in the position for the ref to call it off right he wasn't even in a state where the ref should be worried about him you know you also do need some kind of logic as a ref to understand what the situation really is but if it's hard to tell man if the guy looks like he's hurt and the ref stops it because of it you can't blame the ref so that's the end of the podcast guys i hope you guys enjoyed the episode if you did make sure to like make sure to subscribe to your youtube channel if you listen to the audio version of this and i'll see you guys in the next video